Hi, Marianne. Hi, how are you doing? I'm good, thank you. Hi, everyone. So, I'm Gemma from Dog First Aid Manchester, and Marianne is one of our in house vets who we work with. Um, Marianne graduated from Bristol Vet School in 2010 and went into small animal practice. Um, and she's actually the lady that I go to with all of my questions and she answers every single one of them in depth. So I'm really looking forward to today. <laughs> um, okay, Marianne, so I'm gonna pick your brains now. The first subject that Joe Public wanted to know about was anal glands. What are they? Why do some dogs have issues and others don't? And is it diet related? Oh, well, I, I'm so pleased you're asking me this question because I am weirdly obsessed with answering it. Because um, it, it is a super common, super common to have issues with anal glands, especially in dogs, but actually cats can have issues as well. Uh, lucky for us humans, we don't have these, <laughs> so we don't have to worry about it, in case anyone's wondering. Um, but uh, yeah, so uh, I can, if I show you, for starters, on one of my dogs, where they would exit the body, so, Wombat, can you come here, buddy? <laughs> yes, so if, if you don't want to see anything graphic, look away now. Um, but I'm just going to show you where in the bottom we're looking at when we're looking at where the, uh, these glands exit the body. So, these glands, they're either side of Wombat's rectum, so the last part of his intestinal tract, and they exit the body at like 3 o'clock and 9 o'clock, so sort of here and the same on the other side and um and so they so, so you can if you want to look very carefully at your dog's anus <laughs> you will actually see these little pinpoint holes um just at three o'clock and nine o'clock and that's where they exit the body um now in most dogs the gland itself and I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to correct this because my uh, my one of my professors at vet school was a proctologist, so a bum doctor, and he would kill me if I didn't clarify that they are actually called the anal sacs um, because if you own a German Shepherd or that type of dog, your dog might at one point get a horrible, painful condition uh, called furunculosis, and that's an infection of the anal glands. And the anal glands are not those two guys at three o'clock and nine o'clock. They are all the way around. They're tiny and most of the time we know nothing about them. We hear nothing about them. So the anal sacs, whenever, when, whenever vets and vet nurses and people in general say anal glands, they're always actually talking about the anal sacs, which is really annoying. Um, <laughs> but there you have it. So we'll call them the anal glands for now because that's what people know, know them as, but that's a little confusing. So these glands, they are glands. They are scent glands. And the reason dogs have them is because it produces scent that tells other dogs loads of information about you. So it's kind of like your Tinder profile. So it's like, I am male, I'm neutered, I am, you know, middle-aged, I'm in generally good health, I might have a little bit of a hormonal condition we don't know about yet. They find out so much, of, like honestly, if you could get a dog to talk and just sniff another dog's poo, um, it could it could diagnose everything for you. You wouldn't have to do any blood tests ever, I swear. But um, so so this gland it has so much interesting scent in there, and that's why dogs are so interested in their poop because the way the gland works and the way it it sort of shares this scent information is um, that it empties itself out onto the poop. So I have here for you a tube of toothpaste to use as a demonstration. So imagine you're looking. So you're looking down the barrel of my dog's bum, as, as I showed it to you earlier. And let's say this is the three o'clock anal gland. So this is one of his anal glands, right? So this is the one, let's say his colon is here. So the poo's going to come out here. And then this is his muscular body wall. So that's just the muscle on the side of his body. And so as the poo comes out, it's going to squeeze the, and it's not blue, but it's going to squeeze the scent out and the scent's going to come out and coat the poo. I'm not going to coat my hand into face. <laughs> but it's going, to, it's going to coat the poo. And so then if another dog comes along, especially while that poo's 
still relatively fresh. They're going to have a good smell and they're going to be like, oh my God, there was a sexy lady around here earlier. That's fantastic. I wonder where she is now. Um, but the thing about these glands, like normally when they're working, they're brilliant. Everybody loves it. Um, and in terms of, it, it's not blue, but it can be the texture of toothpaste, this, this stuff that comes out. It can be any texture from really quite watery to a bit grainy and granular and quite thick. And so the thicker it is, the more likely it is to have trouble coming out the tube, right? And when I say tube, the gland itself is actually more like, in a healthy mid-sized dog like Wombat, you're probably talking the size of a, a little grape. And uh, so it's going to be like a little round water balloon, but it does have like a neck as well. So it's got the sort of, if, if you imagine, it would probably be about more like that size, not the size of the whole tube of toothpaste. And you're going to have the gland here that's producing all this lovely scent. And then you're going to have the neck here. And that's where it's going to come out and pop out onto the poo. So, if, so, so why does the gland get uncomfortable or sore? Well, if it gets too full, it gets uncomfortable and sore. And so there's a few different reasons why the gland can get full. The main reasons are, so if you remember the way it empties out, you've got your muscular body wall on this side. You've got your poo on this side. So you need to squeeze it, right? So what's going to make the squeezing less effective? Well, if the poo's too soft, you're not going to get that pressure squeezing it out. And if the body wall's too soft, why would the body wall be soft? Well, you know, if you feel your bicep, hopefully it's nice and firm, you're nice and strong. If you feel your tummy, it, unless you're much skinnier than me, there's going to be a squishy bit, right? So <laughs> if there's a decent fat pad between the muscular bit and the actual gland, then even if a firm poo comes by, the, the gland is just going to sink into the fat pad. It's not going to get squeezed out. It needs two hard surfaces, right, to get squeezed out. So good, strong muscle, nice, firm poo. Either of those things don't happen, then it might fill up. And if it fills up, it's going to get uncomfortable. The worst case scenario is actually, if it's emptying out all the time, it's flushing out any bacteria that might, you know, I mean, it's right near your bum, right? So there's going to be bacteria. And the bacteria is going to try and, you know, wander off in there and, oh, you know, this is quite tasty. Um, so if it's, if it's not getting emptied out, the bacteria will go on in and then it can form an infection. And then the, the wall of the thing is going to get thickened and uncomfortable and inflamed. The wall of this neck of it is going to get thickened and inflamed and uncomfortable. The second this is inflamed, it swells shut. And at that point, there is no emptying it anymore. Um, and, and, and it can become an abscess. So you can get to the point where this whole thing is just full of pus because the bacteria go in, you closed off your exit and so nothing's coming out. Just bacteria will grow and grow and grow and grow. And then this anal gland will get thickened, swollen, sore, painful. Uh, the dog can get a fever from that because you've got an abscess. Abscesses can cause a fever. Um, and you can actually sometimes, if you're looking at your dog's bottom, in some dogs you will actually see swelling sort of pushing out towards the skin where this gland is, has become a full abscess. Um, so if I'm dealing with an early stage situation where, okay, the gland's gotten a little uncomfortable, maybe we had a couple of soft poos a couple of weeks ago, um, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to put my finger up the bottom and I'm going to get behind the anal gland and my gloved lubricated veterinary finger by the way <laughs> um, <laughs> we don't recommend you do this at home because it, it helps to have the experience to be able to judge what it feels like what the general texture of it is and that way if there's any abnormalities like you can get tumors if you're unlucky we'd be able to spot those and normally i can squeeze it out and empty the horrible stinky stuff out um, and if it's early, that's all you need to do. We just will empty it out for you and the dog will feel better. If it's a little bit later than that and we think, oh, do you know what? That was a little bit hard to empty. We might give the dog a couple of days worth of anti-inflammatories to help open this tube up so that it can re-release because it's going to keep producing this discharge forever. So it'll be producing some more by tomorrow as well. So by next week, it better have emptied out. So if we think that this is a bit swollen shut, We'll give you some anti-inflammatories to try and help open it out. And we might say, come back again in a week so we can empty out any that sort of built up during that time of discomfort. Um, if it's infected, if, if an infection's already gone in, so we might be getting pus or blood out of there, we'll tend to want to give an antibiotic. And then your worst case scenario is you've got a full abscess. 
I go to examine the gland and it actually will not empty because it's so close shut. It's really sore and hard and firm and pleasant. And then I'll need to give some medication for a couple of days before you can come back and have it properly emptied. Um, sometimes the dog will actually you know, have the gland be full and be really uncomfortable and sore. And then they'll just so happen to manage to empty it the day that you were coming to the vets. And I'll go in there and be like, oh, it's fine now. It's cured. Um, so that happens as well. But yeah, your you're sort of best case scenario is everything behaves as it should. Your dog's got nice firm poo, nice firm body wall, and it's a lovely scent experience for any other dogs around. Your worst case scenario is you're getting nasty abscesses and fevers. For some dogs, this is like a persistent common problem. Um, and we do do surgery to remove these. It's, a, it's not a nice surgery to do. I mean, you're doing surgery in a very high bacterial area. You're also doing surgery on, um, on the anus and on the actual anal sphincter. You actually have to separate the muscles that control that sphincter. And that is a very important sphincter in the body, one of, one of the most important ones. Um, and, and so, you know, if you do any damage to, to that muscle and that nerve, which is sometimes inevitable if you've got inflammation in that area and, and things can have moved around and gotten stuck together because of all the swellings and all the abscesses you might have had. Um, you know, you can end up with a dog that, uh, that has incontinence with their poo or you're even worse, you know, you can get horrible infections after surgery where the dog doesn't recover. So surgery is an absolute last resort. We only ever consider it for a dog that is having persistent, really painful, unpleasant problems. Um, and in those cases, you know, it's, well, the only thing to do for the well-being of the dog because they are really suffering. So, for example, I had one dog where he had an abscess most months and the first sign of the abscess was a fever. And we tried regularly emptying things out and he'd still end up getting these abscesses. And there was no, there was no sort of way of knowing that it was going to happen until he, was, until he had a fever. Now, with most dogs, they show much earlier signs than that. So you're uncomfortable in that general area, and dogs know, they can be a bit lazy. So you will see dogs licking their actual anus, but a lot of dogs are just like, I'm just itching around there. So if your dog is sort of nibbling or licking at their groin a lot, at their upper thighs, um, or around the, the lower back and the top of their tail, then all of that could be the anal glands. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's... Uh, that it's away from the anal glands that it's a skin problem. It can be the anal glands that can have set that off. They can give themselves a secondary skin infection, but any licking around that area, um, anal glands is definitely a thing to consider as a cause. And hopefully, if you get your dog in at a relatively early stage of that, then you'll get it cleaned out and, and it won't be too much of a problem. The other thing they can do is scooting their bum along the ground. So... Um, I don't know if you've seen dogs do this. It's some dogs, like my dogs have never done it, but some dogs will do it, like even if they're slightly, slightly full. And so they'll sort of be sitting right on their bum with their back legs sort of out to the side, with their front legs in the middle, kind of dragging themselves along. It's kind of funny to watch, but it's, it's you know, they, they are doing it because they're uncomfortable. They're not doing it because, I mean, it's probably really satisfying in the moment, but they probably <laughs> rather not, not have to do it. Yeah. Um, so, so those are the signs you're looking for. And then the other question you asked was, is diet a possible cause? Yeah, absolutely. Because, well, the poo is the possible cause. So if you've got a firm poo, you're fine. So it's not, you know, oh, if it's more protein or more this or that, it doesn't matter. It's the firm poo that you look for. And in the olden days, <laughs> before we had that much research on, on sort of veterinary diets, um, we tended to literally say to people, mix some brown rice or some brown in with your dog's food and it will bulk up the poo and help push that, that gland. Um, now, nowadays, I kind of move away from that largely because it's really important for dogs to get a fully balanced diet. And if we f make them feel too full with rice or bran sometimes, I mean, some dogs need to feel full. And, you know, if you've got a chocolate Labrador, then give them all the bran you like because... 
um, that I'm sure they're eating enough dog food that <laughs> um, they can also have brown. They might feel a bit better for it. But generally speaking, it's just finding the right food for your dog. And you'll hear people, of course, you know, gospeling away about, oh, this is the, this is the food. This will this food will you know change your dog's life. And it's like, no, we're all individuals. Some of us are lactose intolerant. Some of us are gluten intolerant. Some of us eat cheese most days um, and are fine with it. You know, uh, probably not dogs. Dogs are generally lactose intolerant, but. <laughs> but not all of them are. So, you know, it's, it's what works for your dog. It's get that poo firm. It doesn't matter what you're feeding them. As long as it's a complete, balanced, healthy diet, then, you know, don't listen to Linda down the park who says, oh, you know, I've always fed this and it's perfect for my dog. Well, great, it's perfect for your dog's digestion, but we're all different. So just find what works for your own dog. Um, and, and that's what you need to do. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Marianne. See, you always give detailed answers. <laughs> so you don't recommend expressing at home because I think during lockdown, uh, when people rang up, they were saying, you know, try and express them at home, understandably because of coronavirus and it was, you know, one of those situations. But yeah. general rule, it's a no-go. General rule, it's a no-go. Um, yeah, it, obviously, I mean, I cut my own hair at home. So, you know, you, we will do extreme things in extreme situations. <laughs> um, and if you're in an extreme situation, I will say if you are trying to express them at home because you're still shielding or you're in a high coronavirus area and obviously your dog's uncomfortable and you need to do what you can for them but you don't want to put yourself at risk, I, I wouldn't suggest doing the internal version of things. You know, you could potentially cause damage. The risk of damage is fairly low, but it, it, it can cause quite a bit of pain if it's not done correctly. Um, the less unpleasant for you and less unpleasant for your dog way that might work is an external version. So I can't believe I'm about to do this. Look away now if you're um, nervous about graphic things. I'm not going to express them. I'm just going to show you where you would put your hands. One bit. Dada ma, kariad. Dada ma. I am buddy. Oh, okay. here's one back. What you do? Oops. One day you'll see his face. <laughs> what you would do is so we know so the the openings to the glands are like in the anus. You can see them right in the pink bit of the anus. But the glands themselves sit out to the side here a little bit. Um, and so what you do is you go right outside outside where you think the glands might be. And then you're going to push in and towards the anus. You're pushing slightly more towards the front of his body, slightly towards the anus. And you're kind of doing a milking action, bringing it towards you. Um, do keep your face well away from the general area while you're doing this. And I tend to have so a gloved hand, cotton wool in the glove to catch it. Sometimes it comes out nicely, but often because there's a little bit of a build-up pressure, it will shoot out. Um, it stings if it gets in your eyes. So, <laughs> so just have cotton wool available. Um, and, and do it outside. You don't want to be indoors for this. Breathe through your mouth. Um, I don't notice the smell anymore because I always breathe through my, through my mouth before I begin. <laughs> that is a good tip. <laughs> <laughs> okay, perfect. The next question, which um, I have asked you previously, but for Joe Public is hotspots. Why do we get them? What are they? And what is the, the medication and best advice? I would say that, so, you know, at the moment with coronavirus, and, you know, in general in life, you want to go to the vets as little as possible, right? You don't want to be dragging yourself to the vets or taking your dog to the vets if there's an option to avoid that. Um, hotspots is something that I'd say... <laughs> Boys, please can they go for a walk? <laughs> or to the toilet or something. Sorry, I'm going to do work. <laughs> Sorry. Um, they've never had a hotspot, so there's no excuse for them to, to have an opinion on this. Um, hotspots is something that I'd say 80% of the time can be avoided. It's an allergic reaction, generally, in most dogs, and it will tend to be an allergic reaction to an insect bite. So why I say 80% of the time it can be avoided? If that bite is a flea bite, it can be avoided. If that bite is a mosquito bite, a sand fly bite, a stable fly bite, then 
avoiding it's harder, right? It depends on where you live. It depends on, you know, for example, there's a meadow near us at the moment that is made entirely of horse flies. And it's a lovely place to walk for dogs. And you kind of have to decide, well, I know my dogs don't actually have any insect allergies because they eat bees. I try and get them not to, but they do do it. Um, so I know that if they're bitten by a horse fly, not the end of the world, they won't have a hot spot. But if I had a dog that had had hot spots in the past, I would be avoiding areas that I know they're biting insects at the moment. And I would just be making sure that my dog is properly covered for fleas, um, talking to your vet about making sure that you've got a product that's going to do the job for your dog. If your dog has proper allergies, really you want uh, something that's going to kill fleas on contact before they get a chance to bite. Most of the products you can get will require the flea to bite before they'll kill the flea, which is no use if one flea biting you sets you off the hot spot. Mm. Um, so yes, there are products that you can get that will kill them on contact. Um, the, the thing that happens when you get a hot spot, so usually it's an insect bite, as I say, most often it's large dogs. Uh, mo it's really, really common in Labradors, Golden Retrievers, and in German Shepherds. I almost don't see them in other breeds of dogs than that. Those, those dogs are super prone to them, or some individuals in those breeds are super prone, and then most everybody else gets away with it. Um, what happens is you'll get the insect sting, and it is intensely itchy. If you are prone to mozzie bites, like I've had some horrible mozzie bites this season. I live near a river. And what, if I scratch it just a little bit, it just blows up and then it's really itchy and then I will if well I'm a human so I have the self-control uh, and also I have hydrocortisone cream that I can just apply to it and um, just don't scratch it and it will be fine if you're a dog it's itchy you scratch it mm. and then it's really itchy so you really scratch it and you nibble it and you nibble it with your teeth and you scratch it with your teeth you're damaging the skin you're causing really horrible inflammation you've got the inflammation from the allergic reaction on top of the inflammation from you damaging the skin and you're introducing bacteria from your mouth bacteria from the surface of your skin that's going into your skin now penetrating because you you damaged you scratched the bacteria is having a really easy time getting in there and so now you've got pus you've got discharges coming it's crusty it's sticky and it's usually, like I say, in these large breed dogs, so the dog's got heavy, dense fur coat, so it's perfect for bacteria. It's staying moist, it's staying warm. It's warm anyway, because it's all inflamed. It's hot weather usually, it happens then, so it's really hot. Uh, and that's why we call it a hot spot. It feels hot to the touch, um, and it's really unpleasant. And it can grow, you know, it can go from sort of that sort of size, little hot spot, you catch it early, you stick a cone of shame on your dog or something, to sort of yay big really big area the first hot spot i ever saw i thought was a cruelty case i thought it was a neglect case i was um i don't know if i was even in vet school yet and i walked into a consult room and a german shepherd was there and in his sort of bum area he had chewed through the skin so there's a hole that size in his skin you could see the muscle it was that that was horrible and I kind of blinked and I looked at the vet and I looked at the owner and the vet said, look at this. <laughs> That's a scene. And I said, when, how long has it been like this? Thinking, how does this happen? And the owner said, overnight, this wasn't here yesterday. This has happened. Like I woke up and it was like this. And later I asked the vet, that owner is lying, right? There's no way. And he was like, no, no, that happened overnight. And, um, and it did. <laughs> and it, it gets bad so quickly. So that's a horrible thing about a hotspot is, you know, your dog gets stung by something or bitten by something in the morning. You go to work, you can come home to quite a nasty situation already. So anything you can do to minimize the chance of them getting bitten and stung in the first place, specifically if you know they are allergic, that's what you want to do. The most common places they get them is around the sort of bum area or around the face, which is really, really sore and unpleasant. Um, if it happens, most often you do need to see a vet or at least speak to a vet. A lot of vets at the moment are doing telemedicine, so you're able to, you know, especially if you can get a photo to them, they should be confident enough to say, okay, yeah, we can, we can get you an antibiotic, an anti-inflammatory to make this more comfortable and to deal with the infection. Um, if it's, if you catch it really early, you might get away with, so one thing I always do is clip all the fur away, uh, get 
you know, so we can reduce the heat in this area, reduce the moisture in this area, reduce all the sticky stuff that the bacteria are able to hold on to. So clip a nice big area around the hot spot, completely bare. Um, and then I clean it with this wonderful stuff called Hibby Scrub is what I use. You've heard of Hibby Scrub. You're nodding. Yeah. You can use that on the horses as well. <laughs> Yeah, so if you've got horses, great, because uh, you can get like a five litre vat at the country shop, can't you, for like a tenner. Um, at the vets, we generally don't charge too much for it because it is, it is cheap stuff. And it's, it's actually the same stuff we use to scrub for surgery. So it's amazingly antibacterial. It will kill bacteria and continue to kill bacteria in that area for hours after you've used it. So you'll dilute it one, one in ten, one in five with water. You'll just smother it on there with, uh, with, with a bit of cotton wool, get all the debris off, leave it on for a few minutes to really act, and then rinse it really thoroughly because it has got detergent. You don't want to make it stingy and drying. Um, sometimes if it's really superficial, that can actually be enough to treat a hot spot, um, but you really do need to get something for the itch because it's so intensely itchy and unpleasant for dogs. Um, a lot of the time, the infection has gone deeper than that, and they do end up needing antibiotic as well. Mm, I think that's it for hot spots. Any any follow up questions? The, the itch. What what would you what would the vet prescribe? So what um, creams? What creams would they prescribe? And what is the best thing to avoid? I tend not to prescribe creams. Now that might be mm, that, <laughs> that might be controversial. There's there's good arguments both ways, right? So if you apply cream, you're going to get a high concentration of what you need where you need it. Whereas if I give you a tablet, I have to give you quite a lot of it for enough of it to get where it's needed. Um, the reason I usually don't prescribe creams for hotspots personally is because I feel like it's already kind of a sticky situation and I want it to be clean and open to the air and so I don't like applying creams to it. But a lot of vets will. And the cream they'll often use, I mean, to be honest, we have I think one that is licensed, so we'll use that one. And it's called uh, Isoderm and it's got a steroid in it, so it's an anti-inflammatory, so it's like your hydrocortisone cream. And it's also got an antibiotic in it that will help reduce the amount of bacteria on the surface there. In a pinch, in lockdown, if you were using hydrocortisone cream that was for humans, that would be off license. And, you know, if, if you spoke to your vet about it, that would be best because steroids can have side effects. Your vet may have some very good reasons why they think that a steroid is not appropriate for your dog. And actually, I don't really give steroids for hotspots anymore um a lot of vets will and you know in a lot of dogs it's sensible steroids are really cheap usually we can give a steroid tablet we can give a steroid injection um and it will treat the itch the reason i move away from steroids for the most part is because they have so many potential side effects so they're not good for your heart if you've got a heart condition they're hard work for your liver to process they're not good for your immune system. If you use them short term, you're usually okay, but they do weaken the immune system a bit. Um, if you've got diabetes, they're an absolute no-no because they will stop insulin from working on you. Uh, so there's, I just generally feel like steroids are one of those, if you can't afford better treatment or if, um, if, if better, other treatments aren't available for some reason, then fine but they're not my go-to. But, you know, a lot of vets will say, you know what, I'm comfortable giving a couple of days of steroids. You know, it's only a couple of days. I feel this dog is, is healthy enough and strong enough and safe enough. And that's, you know, that's their prerogative. And as long as you're comfortable with it as well, fine, no worries. Personally, I mostly use uh, other tablets. So um, Apoquel is my go-to. It's a relatively new drug, and it also isn't without side effects, in fairness. We thought it was when it came out, which is probably why it got so popular and I got so confident with it. Um, it doesn't agree with every dog. I'd say 90% of my patients get along with it fantastically. It kicks in faster than steroids for most of my patients within about two, three hours. They are super comfortable. I've had clients say, by the time we got home from the vets, the dog wasn't itchy anymore. Um, but it costs like a hundred times more than a steroid. Uh, and every now and again, you get a dog that's a bit grumpy on it, which is a little bit strange and not, not ideal. So there's different, there's different pros and cons to any treatment that, that can be like, a, <laughs> that's just the case 
always for all health conditions in all species. Yeah. Um, so personally, I tend to go with Apoquel, but there's very good reasons why a vet might suggest steroids to you. And there's very good reasons why a vet might say, let's go with a steroid and antibiotic cream rather than going with any tablets at all. They're all good options with, you know, reasons why you might not want to use them. <laughs> um, some people will go with Pyroton as well and like you know in a pinch if you if you again if it's early days and you're like I wonder if I can get away without going to see the vet I've got my cone on my dog I've got them to stop scratching physically I've cleaned the area up I've clipped the area down you know I want to keep them comfortable let's try and give them some Pyroton call the vet make sure that it's safe to give Pyroton to your own dog because again there's some situations where it's not and it has to be the right exact chemical because you get Pyroton, you get Pyrotes, you get all these different ones, and they've actually got slightly different drugs with completely different dosages, and some of them toxic to dogs. Um, but my go-to is we have a little pot of Pyroton on the shelf that my receptionists keep stealing at the moment because they've all got hay fever and they don't want to think they've got COVID. Um, and I'll whack two Pyroton into a dog, and it's it's a mild anti-itching medication. It's not going to do it. If, if your dog's trying to tear their skin off, it won't work. Um, but for some dogs, if, if, it's, if it's a mild enough itch, it can be enough uh, and it can make them feel more comfortable. Perfect. Always good to know. My next one is, um, it's pretty open, I suppose, but tummy issues. So what causes a tummy upset? Uh, what is the treatment? Again, I suppose it would um, depend on the Hello. dog. <laughs> <laughs> are some dogs more susceptible to tummy issues than other dogs oh god yes absolutely and one sort of thing that i've learned since since graduating is you get these you get phases of fashions with dogs so when i graduated it was about the time that poodle crosses were becoming really popular and everything was a cavapoo or a cockapoo or a, and then it's cavachons and something tipu Always something to poo. <laughs> and we learned that the something to poos tend to actually be very prone to skin allergies, which of course we didn't know for a few years because they didn't exist before. <laughs> um, and then now the last few years, the, the pugs, the French bulldogs have been the most popular breeds that we've seen a lot of puppies. Of. Well, maybe not the most popular breeds, but breeds that have gained popularity very quickly. And so we've gone from... I can't legitimately say that I treated a single French bulldog in vet school. If I did, I don't remember doing it. To, I see French bulldogs every week. And most days I see French bulldogs. And so I've gone from not really having much of an idea of what they might be prone to, other than obviously the airway disease and the spinal issues, to, you know, you look at that dog, you know he's going to have problems with his airways generally, and you know that the spine is compressed, so it might be misformed, and you had that explained to you at vet school. But nobody explained that they also have these digestive issues where it's relatively uncommon to get a French bulldog whose digestion is healthy and who isn't farting all over the place. Um, and if all they're doing is farting all over the place and they're otherwise, you know, comfortable and well, <laughs> then that's something that, a, that an owner might decide I can live with this. This is okay. <laughs> I, I have big windows. Um, the mouth. Free through the mouth. <laughs> <laughs> you know, some people have a weaker sense of smell, so it doesn't bother them. Um, you know, my wife is practically anosmic. It works well for me. I can eat as many beans. As I <laughs> um, but you know, it, a lot of the time, it is worse than that. They can be. Oh, like they, they get little bouts of things. And then you're sort of chasing your tail, trying to figure out, well, they're reacting to their food. There's a genetic element to why this is happening, because it's not happening to everybody else. Uh, you know, it'll happen to individuals of any breed, obviously, but some breeds are, almost all of them are affected. And so, you know, there, there are fads and ways of maybe this diet, maybe that diet. And again, I'm going to say the key is just finding the diet that works for them and just working your way down it. Um, so there's a million causes of tummy issues, and I used to work with uh, a vet who would, I feel not reassuringly, say to clients, whenever a dog came in with vomiting or diarrhea, he'd say, it could be anything. You know, when you have a tummy upset, it could be a mild virus, or they ate something that didn't agree with them, or it could be cancer. I'd be like, 
<laughs> cancer, right? <laughs> it's usually not cancer. Um, it can be cancer, but it's usually not cancer. Like, every day I treat tummy issues, and almost every single day, the tummy issues I treat are somebody ate something they shouldn't have eaten, or somebody has a little bit of an infection. Um, and the, the tummy issues we worry about seriously are if there's vomiting. So it's quite common if, if we ate something we shouldn't have eaten. So I'm not talking about like a stone or a bone or something that could get stuck. I'm talking about some poo or a minced up, like the dead squirrel off the road or something, you know, something that will pass through, but may cause some discomfort and damage on the way. Then it often will have its effects consecutively. So it hits the stomach first. You're sick a couple of times and you go off your food a little bit maybe. Then it gets to the small intestine. When you've got problems in the small intestine, you're going to have watery diarrhea, lots and lots of it. Um, and if it's really bad and maybe if there's a horrible bacterial infection, there'll be blood in that diarrhea. But because it came from the small intestine, you might not be able to see the red blood. It might be more that the diarrhea is dark in colour and it really stinks, like has a rotting flesh smell. And that's how you know there's blood in that diarrhea. That is food poisoning. That is definitely we need antibiotics on board. We might need a drip because we're losing so much fluid. Um, or it might only happen two or three times. And then by the end of the day, we're onto the, the colon issue. So it's moved through the small intestine into the large intestine. In the large intestine, the diarrhea is not as watery. It starts, firm, well, firming up is maybe an exaggeration, but it's got a shape to it. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, people describe it as Mr. Whippy, <laughs> which I think like, oh, I'm never eating ice cream again. <laughs> but okay. <laughs> so like a Mr. Whippy, and you might see some mucus and some blood on there, red streak of blood and mucus. And that's because the mucus is produced in the colon. You've got just a little bit of bleeding in the colon. They call that colitis. So sometimes that's all you see. So you can have a dog where he ate something yesterday and then immediately today, you know, he's ha had no vomiting, no watery diarrhea, but, you know, his second or third poo, you know, he does his normal poo and then ugh, there's a bit of a squidgy bit with maybe a bit of blood or mucus. All he's got there is colitis. Number one cause of colitis is dietary indiscretion, uh, which is, yeah, something not quite right. And do you know what? He'll be fine in two to five days. You don't need to do anything um, except maybe try and reduce the further dietary indiscretions. Uh, there are other causes though, and actually this, in this weather, heat stress can cause it. So if they've been out in the hot weather too much, if they've had too big of a day, too much excitement, bit too much stress maybe can cause it. Um, and worms can cause it as well. So if you're seeing it sort of repeating and you haven't wormed your dog recently, get a good quality wormer. And just do that before you speak to the vet. Um, but obviously, you know, you can have a dog that has blood in the poo persistently and is colon cancer. It's just that happens really infrequently. Um, but the ones I worry about are if we're vomiting persistently multiple times in an hour, um, if we're vomiting for more than a day, you know, let's, let's say he vomits twice today, three times today. Uh, if he's well in himself, he's bright, he wants to eat, I'm just going to put him on a bland diet, little and often meals, and I'm just going to see how he goes. As long as he seems really comfortable and happy, you know, you talk about your full body exam, this is a time to do it. So you do all your vitals, uh, you check the comfort of the tummy. If you're happy with all of that, that can wait. We'll see if, if he's still vomiting by tomorrow, we need to see the vet. If he's vomiting, you know, four, five, six times in the day, we need to see the vet today because there could be something stuck there. Um, and something stuck there is another possible cause of, of vomiting and diarrhea. I had a dog just yesterday who had surgery who had been eating and passing food, uh, passing poo, sorry, <laughs> eating and passing poo, hadn't vomited in several days. Um, and yet yesterday he had a barbecue stick taken out of his stomach that will have gotten in there on Saturday. So yesterday was Tuesday for those, no, yesterday was Wednesday. So Saturday, he will have eaten the barbecue stick. Sunday, he was poorly and went to the out of hours. Monday, he was fine, eating, keeping it down, pooing. Tuesday, he was so-so. I saw him again. Wednesday, we took the barbecue skewer out. So it, 
you know, although you think about if it's a stone, it gets stuck, nothing's coming out the other end, everything's coming out the front end, and he doesn't want to eat. But if it's something that stuff can get around, we're still eating and pooing, and yet there's something very seriously wrong in there. And the sign with him was he was in pain. So if you're, if, if you're seeing signs of abdominal pain, I think I did do a video on this, it'll be on the YouTube somewhere, but we're talking um, yawning a lot, licking the lips a lot, um, drooling. With this particular dog, it was this thing called the prayer position. So you can, you can look that up. The prayer position is where um, it looks kind of like a play bow, yeah, but like not fun. fun. Exactly. So bum in the air, front of the body on the floor. And they're trying to stretch their abdomen out because they're just trying to get a comfortable position. And that's generally a sign of really severe pain. Um, so that's a time that you think, okay, there's something very, very wrong here. But yeah, there's, there's a million causes for tummy upset. Usually they just ate something that didn't agree with them. And if it passes through quickly, great. Um, then you don't always need treatment. I always say little and often with the food. So smaller, more frequent meals. If you can get an intestinal diet, then brilliant. Uh, you buy those from the vet, and you can buy those over the counter from the vet. So we're talking, they might be called intestinal, gastrointestinal, digestive diet, something like that. Um, they're designed with the right proteins for the gut to replenish itself and to heal itself. We used to starve dogs for like up to 48 hours. We'd be like, oh, right, he's had something, didn't agree with him, no food for 48 hours, and that allows the gut to heal uh, or to rest. We don't do that anymore because the research has shown that that's actually not helpful. The gut needs a, it needs to be, those gut cells need to be constantly bathed in nutrients. If they are not being bathed in nutrients, if they're empty and there's just stomach acid and water going past them, they are going to become stunted and they're potentially even scarred. They're not going to heal properly. It's going to take longer for them to heal. They may not heal to as good of a condition as they otherwise would have done uh, because they will starve and die. The cells will starve and die. They need that food to be constantly washing over them. So we would still feed a dog. You know, if he was sick, then let's try feeding him a small amount in an hour. You know, he should have settled down in an hour. If he's, if he's not keeping stuff down, we call the vet. Uh, the vet can give you a lovely injection that lasts 24 hours and stops the dog from vomiting completely so that we can get any medications in that the dog needs and so that we can keep getting the food in. Um, with that particular injection, if the dog vomits once they've had that injection, that is serious. The only reason dog vomits when they've had that injection is because they need to be in the hospital. They might need to be in the hospital because they're suddenly stuck. They might need to be in the hospital because they've got parvovirus or something horrible like that. Parvovirus is a really nasty intestinal virus, which can vaccinate against. Um, but yeah, they, they should probably be in the hospital if they're being sick when they've had that injection. That's it. Any, any more? What do you want to ask about? Just... Um... I was going to say about the starving because they don't say to starve anymore. What do you suggest um, that they be fed, you know, the intestinal? But if some people say, oh, chicken and rice or white fish and rice, is that is that the best thing that they should eat, really? That's fine, yeah, because we're looking at, so the most important things to get in there is good quality protein and some potassium. So, yeah, a lean meat, white fish or chicken is perfect. You don't really want a red meat. That's a little bit harder to process, and it's usually a bit fattier. And rice, potato, just a carb so that there's something in there. Peas are fine as well. If your dog digests peas well, I would cook them first to, to sort of, so there's less breaking down that the dog needs to do. Mm -hmm. Potatoes are great. Rice, like, rice, I will say rice is a really popular one, but it does tend to come out the other end unchanged a lot so I feel like I wonder why the potato is more digestible um I avoid gluten now dogs dogs don't tend to be allergic to gluten that's only been seen in a couple of border terriers ever so far um so like a full-blown gluten allergy would be like if you're if you've got hives or something when you eat gluten but a lot of dogs do find it harder to digest gluten so I'm talking bread I'm talking pasta um, you know, a lot of dogs love that stuff, and a lot of dogs digest it well enough, but if they're having a tummy upset, I would stick away from it. Okay. Um, the other thing that's quite popular is egg. Egg white is fine, again, that's a good quality protein. Egg yolk is not much protein in there, it's mostly fat. 
And fat is really hard to digest if you're having a tummy upset. And actually, you really want to stay away from too much fat. Dogs shouldn't have too much fat anyway. They can't process it as well as we can. But especially if they're having a tummy upset, it's too much work for the pancreas and it can actually give them pancreatitis and then you've got a long-term issue. So if you are giving your dog egg, scrambled egg or whatever to try and help them, uh, to try and give them something bland, no fat with the egg. So you're not, not cooking it in butter and you're taking the egg yolk out and you can have yourself a nice custard. <laughs> Right, okay. So the next thing is injections. What in, what injections are essential and why? There's always talk, I think, in doggy groups about, and I suppose in baby groups as well, because uh, first-time mothers also discuss what their child mm -hmm. should be having. So I often see this in doggy groups. And what is your essential injections and why? Oh, it's so much more complicated with children than with dogs, I swear. <laughs> Like, and, and with dogs it's still complicated because it, it shouldn't be like we have a pretty simple streamlined version um but immunology is a bit of a minefield so like the simple answer to question is every dog in the uk should be vaccinated against parvovirus hepatitis um, and leptospirosis now, if they are being vaccinated against parvovirus, which is that horrible intestinal infection, it kills puppies, kills them by the hundreds every year. I see them die, so I know. <laughs> um, it's also, it's unpleasant for adult dogs. It can kill adult dogs. It can kill older dogs. Um, most often, and it certainly can hospitalize them. It's similar to, I guess, in humans, uh, Campylobacter maybe, or Salmonella, which dogs can also get and carry and transmit to us, by the way, but there are no vaccines for those. Um, but it's that sort of level of, if you've got a weak immune system, it could definitely kill you. If you've got a strong immune system, it will probably make you quite ill. Uh, and if you've got a sort of standard immune system, it could well hospitalize you. So parvovirus definitely horrible, horrible disease causes bloody diarrhea, extremely painful bloody diarrhea, um, and very, very fatal to puppies. Um, and so even if you're like, oh, my dog's got a lovely immune system, great, but what about the puppy in the park <laughs> that you've just walked your dog? You know, maybe your dog's picked up a little bit of parvovirus. Oh, I'm fine. It'll just multiply a bit in my gut because my gut's where it likes to multiply. I'll poo it out. You know, my mum might have cleaned it up, but that was a bit of a sloppy poo because it had virus in it. So maybe a little bit of it got left. What do puppies love to do? They love to eat poo, lick poo. Fantastic. You know, and, and that's how uh, the puppies we treat end up getting parvovirus and sometimes dying. Um, and also, you know, bitches who are pregnant or who are uh who have just recently given birth and they're just pottering out to go to the toilet, if they pick up parvovirus, then that will kill all of their puppies. Um, so parvovirus is a must, very, very, very important. Hepatitis, actually quite similar in that it's spread in the poo. Um, and the vaccine for the hepatitis is in with the parvovirus vaccine. It's also in with the distemper vaccine. Distemper virus is really rare in dogs in the UK. We don't see it much, but it's, it's also seen in wildlife, as is parvovirus. So both of these can be transmitted by foxes. Um, how, uh, distemper, I think badgers, distemper as well. Distemper's a weird one, bats and seals. <laughs> I, I don't treat bats and seals very often. In fact, I've never treated a seal. So <laughs> my expertise on that is, is none but I know that you definitely see it in wildlife. Um, and I have treated dogs that have distemper in the UK, both in terms of dogs that have just turned up and suddenly now I have distemper, I must have got it from a wildlife source of some kind. I didn't have to lick a fox. I went to an area where there was fox poo probably and walked in it and cleaned my, licked my foot later, something like that. Um, but also because there are more rescues being brought in, so a lot of people are rescuing dogs from places like Romania, where distemper is far more common, and so I'm getting dogs coming in from Romania with, you know, neurological signs, or he walks a bit skittishly, or one of his legs is deformed because he had distemper at one time. Um, and, and you're never quite sure, are we bringing in dogs that are carrying distemper potentially because there's no legal requirement for a distemper vaccine before you 
import a dog. So the only vaccine you have to have before you import a dog from, uh, well, before you import a dog, I think that I know of, is rabies. Um, so other than rabies, we could be importing dogs with absolutely any infectious disease, including ones that are rare in this country, like distemper. And we are importing a lot more dogs than we used to be, although not in 2020, but <laughs> until 2019. <laughs> we so, so that's one of your vaccines. So it's the parvovirus distemper hepatitis vaccine. It has the one I use as a little orange sticker, but there are a few different ones around. Um, the vaccine is given to puppies. And then after the first booster, which is given you know, about a year later, it's given every three years. So it's not given very frequently. The, the risk of vaccination, we're talking side effects, four per 10,000 doses reported. Or is it per 100,000? I think it's per 10,000. So very, very few side effects. And the vast majority of those side effects are something like a transient fever, um, a little bit of diarrhea, some inflammation at the area of where the injection was given. So we're not talking about serious side effects. Of course, whenever your dog has anything put into their body, whether it be food, whether it be that they inhaled something, whether it be a vaccine, there's always a risk that they happen to be the one who has a weird immune reaction to it but we're talking extremely rare issues uh, versus something that kills dogs on a very regular basis, like parvovirus. And the same applies to leptospirosis. So leptospirosis is bacterial infection. And with bacteria, with vaccines for bacteria are not as good as vaccines for viruses. Like there are viruses I've had a vaccine for that I will be covered with, covered with that vaccine for life. I will never need to have another injection. And yet I will still always be immune. It doesn't work like that for bacteria. Um, first off, we have to vaccinate more often. The vaccine might not last as long. And um, it is harder to tell by taking a blood test whether you're immune or not. So uh, some people who are worried about vaccinating their dog when it's not necessary will say, can I take a blood sample from my dog to see whether they need the vaccine? And for the distemper and parvovirus, you can. So the vet can take a blood sample test it to see how many antibodies are in there. And if there's sufficient antibodies for parvovirus and distemper, they can say, okay, well, you know, if you like, we can wait. We, you know, we don't need to vaccinate today. We can wait a year and repeat, repeat the blood test in a year. And generally speaking, you know, the blood tests haven't been used and studied as much as, they sh as, as I would like them to have. So there's an element of, is it possible that my antibody levels might reduce six months from now and then I'm not covered enough and then I need a vaccine? Yes, it is possible. We can't guarantee that it isn't. So if you're taking the blood test instead of doing the vaccine, you are taking a, a risk on that because it doesn't have the same high level of guarantee. Um, with vaccines, again, vaccines are not 100% effective. They're 99.8% effective or something in that region. So there are going to be dogs that are vaccinated that are not actually immune. Um, but we've been using vaccines for a lot longer, so we've got better level of confidence that if I vaccinate your dog against parvovirus, he will be at least three years safe from parvovirus. Whereas if I take a blood sample and check and I see that your dog is immune against parvovirus today, I'm not as confident to tell you how long that immunity is going to last because we don't have the, the data on, on those tests in the same way. Um, leptospirosis, there is no test because I can test your dog and not see and, and, and see loads of antibodies and then your dog can go and pick up leptospirosis and still get ill. Um, honestly, this is the point where immune immunology just gets so complicated and it's just, oh my God. You put five immunologists in a room, ask them one question, you get 15 different answers. They disagree with themselves, let alone each other. Um, and it's, it's just so complicated. So I try and sort of break it down to what do the experts broadly agree on? <laughs> and what do I know from my experience that doesn't contradict that? Because obviously they're talking about data sets of hundreds of thousands I've given tens of thousands of doses of vaccines by now, possibly hundreds of thousands, but not millions like, like the data sets they're looking at. So, you know, when you're looking at your own personal experience, you always have to compare that to my personal experience could be in this one instance, completely different than the, the personal experience of almost everybody else. And so just because I've had something good happen or something bad happen, doesn't 
mean that that is what usually happens and you have to ask okay well what, what's usually happening and does that fit with my experience with lactose spirosis my experience is i get dogs that come in very very poorly usually older dogs actually um you know 10 12 years old often and they're coming in vomiting they're coming in not eating they're coming in very badly dehydrated and i'll look at the whites of their eyes and it's jaundice there i can see yellow and I think this could be very, very bad. They've got a high fever. And I speak to their owners. And, you know, unfortunately, because I say to them, you know, we've, we've, we've got jaundice. We've got something very seriously wrong. It could be leptospirosis. It could be a few other things. And sometimes the decision is to put them to sleep because, well, we're talking about an infectious disease. It's infectious to humans. Um, the owner might be worried about that. And cost can be an issue because... You're coming in with, like, to save your dog, we will have to hospitalise them for days, a week or two. Like, this is not going to be a quick fix, and we're going to have to do tests. And so for, for some people, and actually for a lot of people, that just feels like too much, you know, and especially when you've got an older dog. It, it's the balance of, am I going to save my dog, or am I going to put my dog through several days of, unpleasant hospitalization and then still lose him yeah uh, so it's really tragic um and it's, it's horrible to lose dogs left dose viruses but unfortunately we do and and dogs that you know you never know whether you could have saved them because you weren't given the chance to try and it's completely understandable why sometimes you're not given the chance to try so left dose viruses horrible horrible disease it causes kidney and liver failure uh causes high fevers it's just awful um, we don't know exactly how common it is, to be honest, uh, because it's not uncommon to actually put a dog to sleep when you suspect it, when it, it could have been one of three or four different things, all of which were very serious. Yeah. Um, so there will be cases that are not tested because the dog it was decided not to continue with the case. Um, but, but it certainly is something that we do see. It's something that kills dogs of all ages. It's transmissible to humans. It's transmitted in urine. Uh, the vast majority of mammal species can, can carry leptospirosis. Dogs and humans can get ill and die from it. Other species will wander around with it quite happily. Rats love having leptospirosis. It's a hobby. So uh, if you're a rat and you're hanging out in the wild, you've probably got leptospirosis. Very high chance that you've got it. Bowls. Um, so what you'll do is you'll wander around with your leptospirosis, with these bacteria, wandering around your liver and your bloodstream, and you'll pee it out, and you'll pee it into a river or a pond or a water puddle or any kind of water course, um, or just around the farm where you're hanging out. And then the dog will come up and he'll drink from the puddle or the river, or you know he'll be walking around on the farm, he'll lick his paws, and he'll pick up the leptospirosis bacteria. And depending on how his immune system is, whether he's vaccinated um, and just how much he consumes, he may get ill with the leptospirosis. He may carry the leptospirosis in his body for a period of time and then get rid of it, um, which is fine for him, but he may have transmitted it to somebody else in the meantime, including a member of your family. Let's try and avoid anybody ending up in the hospital, especially at the moment. So... Vaccination for leptospirosis, for me, is a must. The um, World Small Animal Veterinary Association, the WSAVA, so they're like our version of Wombat. <laughs> they're our version of the WHO or the World Health Organization. They're who, they're who makes all the big, important decisions. Yeah. They will call the parvovirus distemper hepatitis vaccine a core vaccine, meaning wherever you are in the world, you should have a vaccine for that after the age of 16 weeks, so after your mum's antibodies have gone. A lot of puppies will have their vaccines earlier than that so they can start socialising, and that's great, but you should get a vaccine after 16 weeks as well to make sure that the mum's antibodies haven't interfered with and reduced the level of immunity that you've got there. Um, and ideally, they should be kept up to date with their boosters. Uh, with leptospirosis, that is a non-core vaccine according to the WSAVA. So that means that there are presumably countries in the world or certain types of lifestyle where your risk of getting leptospirosis is low enough that it's not worth vaccinating. I don't believe that's the case in the UK for any dog uh, that is being properly cared for, because if your dog's being properly cared for, they are having some time spent outside in the day. 
Um, and they're probably not spending all of that time in a sterilized yard. Uh, they're probably, you know, going out, uh, going out around the block or to the park or maybe even into the hills, somewhere nice. Um, and all of those places you can pick up leptospirosis. So I don't think there's anywhere safe from leptospirosis unless you're that little old dog that really can't go very far and walks to the bottom of the garden and back. There are still going to be rats in the garden, realistically, I would think. And if you're a little old dog, you're going to have a weaker immune system. So even that dog, I think, it's very hard to make an argument against vaccinating him for leptospirosis. If you want your dog to be as safe as possible, you have them vaccinated against leptospirosis, distemper, hepatitis, and parvovirus. And the leptospirosis vaccine is going to need to be annual because at the moment we don't have a better way of, of protecting them against it. Um, it, it's not a mild bacterial infection, it's a, it's a potentially fatal disease. That's great, thanks so much for that Marianne. And again, loads of detail, all the reasons why we should, which is why I love coming to you for this <laughs> question. It's such a big issue, you know, you can't, you just, yeah, it is, it's such a huge issue. <laughs> Well, Jeff gets his, his vaccinations, but I brought it up just plainly because you always see the, the chitter chatter. And perhaps they read the, the newspaper there a few years ago. It, it's got a huge readership. And, you know, stories, scare stories go viral. You know, yeah. the, what's the thing? The lies, lie can get halfway around the world before uh, the truth has got its shoes on. That's absolutely what happened. Fleas. Mm. We always say um, that um, onions and the onion family generally toxic they are to dogs. Um, what about treating fleas with garlic powder? Um, <laughs> <laughs> yes. Because yeah, because you see it, you see it sold at Crufts. So what is the difference between that and um, you know because we advise against it? Yeah. Oh, fleas, man, so many opinions, so many thoughts, so many views. Um, fleas, they're a pain, right? They're a menace. Are they dangerous? Oh, they can be. So they can carry blood parasites in cats, which can kill kittens. Very, very bad. Uh, most of the fleas you find on dogs are actually cat fleas. So if your dog might hang out with cats or might share an environment with cats, which again, the dog goes outside, probably the case, then I suppose it's a community-spirited thing to keep dogs and cats protected against fleas. Um, with dogs, the issue of fleas is that they can carry tapeworm. So what happens is the flea's got a weird stage of the tapeworm life cycle inside it. Uh, flea lands on the dog, dog's grooming himself, might swallow the odd flea or two, get tapeworms, which is again, transmissible to humans, transmissible to other dogs. Usually it's just a bit of a pain, but for some individuals it can be quite serious. My parasitology lecturer, um, once got a lump on his shoulder and uh, they used to joke that he had a tapeworm because he was losing weight and they named it Wilbur and <laughs> stopped being funny when the lump got bigger and he went to the doctors I nearly said the vets <laughs> he should have gone he should have gone to see himself because he was a parasitologist <laughs> and they cut a huge tapeworm cyst out of his shoulder <gasps> they can also cause cysts in your brain so although we you know we like to joke about tapeworms being oh they're not really an issue um they're not um, and and you know, it, it, but but fleas are they're a menace. They're an unpleasantness. If you've got allergies, they're really and un, un, not nice. But they're they're not generally going to kill anyone. Um, so whether or not you treat your dog for fleas is going to be down to your own opinion, your own experiences. Probably, I do treat mine. Um, if you treat your dog for fleas, you're going to want to use something that works. So are you going to want a repellent, or are you going to want something that kills the the parasite well you know you might feel that a repellent is sufficient you might be like oh, I mean, i'm not really bothered and i don't really want to spend loads of money and um you know maybe my dog's got a dicky tummy and he reacts to a lot of things so i don't really want to give him too much of anything so i want to use something that's just a repellent citronella repels insects generally it's not brilliant dogs might not like the smells might not be that nice for your dogs um you've got this Fuller's, uh, not Fuller's Earth, that's used for cat litter. Well, my, diatomaceous Earth, there you go. This is a weird thing, I've never used it, but the idea of it is it's, it's a really fine, sharp dust, and because it's sharp, it will cut up the, the, any insects and, like, 
lacerate and murder them. I, I don't know of any studies to do with it, so I don't know about its safety. You know, I, I, I get nervous about dust because airways and, you know, does it stay in there if you inhale it? And, you know, you can think like asbestos styly, is it going to cause problems? And I don't know, um, but it is something that's popular and a lot of people use, and, and that's how it should be working. Garlic is a repellent, um, so you have horses, so you've probably heard of, you know, chucking garlic all over your horse or feeding your horse garlic powder. We all know that if we eat garlic, we stink pretty badly afterwards. Um, and that's the principle of, you know, you eat garlic, you smell bad, the fleas don't want to eat you. Um, the fleas are vampires. Um, that's fine, uh, but... Garlic is toxic to dogs. In large quantities, it causes liver failure. In any quantities, it will cause abnormalities in the blood. It will cause anemia. Um, now, in a dog that is young, healthy, has a nice, strong liver that's reproducing itself properly, has uh, you know plenty of red blood cells, then having a few red blood cells damaged by garlic and some extra work on the liver because of the garlic won't necessarily make them ill. But my issue with garlic powder being used is that it is not the only option. It is not the best option. And it is the only option I know of that is actively dangerous. And they don't flip and tell you. They sell you this stuff in a pot and do they say, don't use it if your dog has anemia. Don't use it if your dog might have a liver problem. They don't even tell you that. Yeah. That's, that's unethical. That's unconscionable. Do not sell somebody a product as though it was one million percent safe if you could actually kill some of them. Um, it, it just, you know, and, and also just, it gives the impression, doesn't it, that garlic is safe. It like, if, like we say on the courses, garlic is a toxin to dogs. And yeah. it, there's always people looking around going, hang on a minute, but I give my dog, how, what do you mean? It's, and, and because if you're buying, if you're selling garlic for dogs, you're saying dogs can have garlic. And so I won't worry if my dog has a bit of curry sauce or swallows those few garlic cloves I just dropped while I was cooking. And I should bloody worry. <laughs> I should worry. Um, so that's what I really don't like about it is it, it's just the opposite of public education. It's public misinformation to be selling something as though it was safe when that is a toxin that you're selling there. And yet, okay, you know, if you give any flea product, if you're giving advocate. Um, you know, I, I have had a dog poisoned by Advocate because the owner, for some reason, was putting it in her dog's food. And um, Advocate is a spot on. Yeah. And the dog had to spend an afternoon, only an afternoon, but he had to spend an afternoon in the hospital. If you give a flea product the wrong way, if you give an overdose of it, you could seriously harm an animal. So that's true for, for anything. But, yeah, I, I really don't like the garlic because we're talking about something that there are better products you can use, including, you know, non-medical ones, if that's what you prefer. And those have currently, to my knowledge, no evidence of being potentially harmful. Uh, and I just, I don't want to give my money to a company that I feel is, is messing me about and lying to me. Yeah. Um, you know, I use, I use medical products uh, because most dogs digest them fine. Most dogs, you never see an issue. You do get the odd dog that, oh, he vomited this flea tablet and then he vomited this flea tablet and, okay, well, he's not having flea tablets anymore because it's not, it's not right for him. Um, and that's fine. But, um, you know, for mine, it works out well. I give it once a month. It's a chewy, so that I actually really enjoy it. Um, one day, there'll be resistance to those products. There, there's already a little bit of resistance to some of the older products. That's how life evolves um you know fleas will evolve resistance to anything we try and use against them um be that garlic or anything else <laughs> they'll learn to love it one day um but uh yeah i, I think garlic specifically yeah there's no there's no reason to use it above things that are safer and better that well, one of my questions, which you've covered there, is um, do the do fleas become immune to a particular product? So should you be changing, chopping, and changing it regularly? There's a good argument for doing that. Absolutely. Um, now we're going into an area that I um, have not been familiar with really since vet school because 
parasite treatment rotation is huge in farm industry. So if you're a farm vet or a farmer, or you work on a farm, then you will know that you have to be super careful about your parasite treatments. We don't want to, resistance to develop, so we might be taking poo samples to check for worm eggs and only giving a wormer if there are worm eggs found. You can do that with dogs as well. Um, dog poo smells, but you, <laughs> you can do that. It smells so much worse than horse poo. Um, you can do that. Uh, you can give diff a, a different type of medication at different intervals. So that's a lot harder with the flea products in dogs just because there's this one that lasts three months and there's this one that's a spot on and there's this one that's monthly and there's this one that's also got a wormer in it. And so it's a little bit more complicated to, to do it that way. Uh, and especially you might say, I, I really want one that kills on contact because my dog has allergies or because my dog keeps sticking his head in rabbit holes and coming out covered in fleas. Um, and so you're very limited. You're like, well, if it, if it kills on contact, it can't be a tablet. It has to be a spot on um, or, or a collar. Uh, there is one collar that's licensed that is a genuine I kill fleas collar. That's called Seresto, um, and it's available on prescription, although I think you can get an online prescription. So there are vets who work for online pharmaceutical companies who will actually write a prescription for your dog. Um, generally speaking, you ask for a prescription from your vet and they'll print, print one off or email it for you. Um, but... Yeah, it is, it is more complicated to, to balance yeah. mixing, mixing your flea products, but there's a, there's a good argument for doing it. And then the other thing about using spot-on products and surface-active products that are going to be on coating on the top of the skin is they're great if you want a contact kill, but you are, are we poisoning watercourses? If my dog is going and swimming a lot... Um, number one, if he swims, actually it washes the product off, so the product becomes less effective and it might run out sooner, um, so it might not benefit my dog as much. But also, that is a that is a pesticide that's going into a watercourse there. So whereas I used to be all for the contact kill product because I want to kill those fleas and I don't want them biting anyone, um, I kind of changed my mind because my dogs do like to go in the river, and so I don't use those products on them now because... I think we, we, we don't see fleas on them touch wood with the products that we're using that are not contact kill. And I just think it's better for the environment. I feel more comfortable with it. But yeah, there's, you know, arguments different ways. Perfect. Okay. So I think I'll cover... Um just one more subject, Marianne, because we've taken up quite a lot of your time. Um, one of the things that people ask about is um, is bloat. Um, oh. so, yeah, so symptoms and prevention, um, if, if you don't mind. Bloat, GDV, gastric dilatation and volvulus. That's a good word, isn't it? That's a Greek word, and it means twisting. So dilatation is to dilate, gastric means the stomach. So bloat is when the stomach swells up and in most cases of bloat in dogs, because bloat can also happen in cows, but it's very different. Most cases of bloat in dogs, the stomach also twists. Um, and it will tend to twist in a certain direction, but it can twist the other way and it will twist a good 180 degrees, sometimes more. Um, if you've got a poodle, as in a miniature poodle, then don't worry, your dog almost certainly will never get bloat in its life. I have, I think I've seen one case of bloat in a small dog. All of the other cases I've seen have been in large and giant breeds. So we're talking Labradors, Retrievers, uh, flat coat setters, standard poodles, German Shepherds, I'd say German Shepherds are maybe slightly at higher risk than some others, um, Pointers and uh, Great Danes, Great Danes are at a massive risk of bloat. So Great Danes are, at the moment for me, the only breed where I'm like, if I had a Great Dane, I would have a what's called a prophylactic gastropexy. So that is where they do, they basically do the GDV surgery, the bloat surgery, before you ever have bloat to prevent it from ever happening. And that involves sticking the stomach to the side of the body wall, so attaching it in place, anchoring it so it can't twist, uh, even if 
the stomach starts trying to do that. Um, the reason it happens still isn't really well understood. We know a few different factors. So certain breeds are prone and specifically deep chested breeds. Because actually, if you, if you look at your dog sideways on, the stomach isn't in that sort of tummy bit. The stomach is in the chest bit. It's under the ribs. It's right here under the ribs. So if that, if that area of, of rib cage, of the back of the ribs, is really, really deep, then you've got a lot of space for the stomach to potentially want to move. Um, and it, it's, it's easier for it to do that. So we've got our larger giant breed dog. Um, and a lot of the time, the thing that sets off bloat is if they swallow a lot of air. So swallowing air might be something a dog does if they're bolting their food really fast, eating their food really fast. It's something also that they might do if they're very stressed and panting. Actually, a dog that pants a lot will tend to swallow air a lot. Um, and also, if they're eating out of a raised dish that's raised off the floor, understandably, some dogs need a raised dish because they've got arthritis or something like that, uh, and it's harder for them to reach the floor. But if they are eating off of a raised dish, they are actually slightly more likely to swallow a little bit more air. Um, the other thing that's believed is if they are eating and exercising very close together, um, that does, that's been shown by a study to increase the risk of bloat happening. Uh, so that's something that seems to have been a precursor to a lot of cases of bloat. So your dog gets a bunch of air in their stomach. And there are some other sort of things that might be able to cause bloat, like just you have a general tummy upset and gas builds up. The gas builds up and then the stomach starts to twist because I guess the gas sort of lifts this bit of the stomach up, you know, towards the sky like a hot air balloon and then it starts to twist and it starts to twist and then your your dog gets pretty unpleasantly ill um the signs the, the good news i guess is that the signs of bloat are pretty classic it's very rare to get a dog that has bloat that is not like textbook bloat um so the signs are very classic we've got a dog that is dry retching they are trying to vomit but because their stomach has twisted around their food pipe, their esophagus, that's twisted shut. So nothing's coming up when they're trying to vomit. Some froth might come up from the esophagus and just because, you know, when you're retching, you're sort of hacking up a bit of foam around the face. But there's no vomit coming up. The dog is in obvious pain. Uh, they might even be starting to have trouble breathing because, like I say, the stomach's actually, you know, it's right up the front of your abdomen. It's under your rib cage, And so if it fills up with air, it's going to start pushing on your chest and sort of restricting your lungs a bit. So you might see panting, breathing faster, or just a bit more difficulty breathing. We talk in the course about how uh, if the dog's having trouble breathing, they might assume a certain position. So the front legs might be slightly further apart and they might start stretching their neck out a little bit to try and make the breathing a little bit easier. The dog's really unsettled. Uh, they're, they're getting up, lying down, walking around, whining. They're just not happy. They're telling you they're not happy. Um, and then often but not always, you physically see bloat, which is where it gets its name from. You physically see the dog widening around the front of the chest, the, tummy, uh, the, the back of the chest, the front of the tummy region. You don't always see that because your dog is deep chested. They might be very furry. Um, the stomach's got quite a lot of expansion it can do before it starts pushing those ribs out. But you do definitely see dogs and it's mad. It looks like they've swallowed a beach ball. Like you, you go from having a normal shaped dog, you know, might have been nice and lean and everything to a dog that's just got this, this huge round tummy and it, it's, and all of that is the stomach. And you're almost like, that can't be right. That's not, you know, it surely it would explode, but no, it, it really expands and it, so so painful um it's extremely serious it's life-threatening um both because you've got this gas that's pressing on everything including pressing upwards so you've got um you know you've got your, your dog's stomach there you've got your dog's back here between the dog's back and the dog's stomach is the aorta and the vena cava the major blood vessels and they're being compressed so actually the, the dog's circulation is now being seriously compromised the dog's now going into shock um, the, the lung function is being compromised, so they're not getting enough oxygen in, they're not getting enough oxygen around the body, um, and all the other, ox uh, other organs are being crushed. Some really weird chemical stuff is going on inside the stomach now, where uh, stomach acid is being pumped out in a weird way, and so now you're getting chemical imbalances in the bloodstream, which can cause heart failure, can cause full-blown heart attack. 
Um, and yeah, horrible, painful, dangerous disease. So if bloat is recognized and treated within the first six hours, the success rate of surgery and sort of the, the survival rate, I believe is, it was 80% when I was in vet school and I think it's quite a bit better now. I think it's even up towards the 90% range. So the survival rate is actually really, really good if we find and treat it really quickly. Um, but it is life or death. So it is call the vet as soon as you even suspect it might be low. If it's not, it's, you know, nobody's embarrassed. It's fine if, it, if they just have gas and they're fine now. But to be honest, if you think it's bloat, it's bloat. Um, so you'll get to the vets. They will probably want to give your dog a very strong painkiller. They will probably want to get a lot of fluid into your dog very quickly. They'll put a catheter in each leg. They'll have loads and loads of drip fluid going in because that circulation is collapsing and they'll try and keep that going. We we'll want to do blood tests to check what's going on with the organs and what, what, what the weird chemical imbalances in the blood are so we can start normalizing those. We'll usually x-ray and we're x-raying to see whether the stomach is twisted or not generally. Um, because if it's not twisted, then we might be able to decompress the dog by putting a tube down the food pipe into the stomach and just getting all the gas and fluid out that way. Your dog, if they've bloated, they still will likely need surgery, even if we've been able to decompress them non-surgically, but it's nice to have a stable dog that is well in themselves before you do surgery, if you've got the option. Um, unfortunately, most of the time it's emergency surgery. So we will uh, open the stomach up and we are talking unzipping right all the way down the whole dog, um, untwisting the stomach, decompressing the stomach. Sometimes the spleen, because the spleen's really close to the stomach, it sort of hangs off the side of the stomach a little bit. And sometimes it's had its entire blood supply closed off. So we, have, we sometimes have to remove the spleen, not too often. Sometimes parts of the stomach have actually, because if you imagine the stomach is a balloon with two balloon ends and it's twisted, so both balloon ends are twisted shut and that's its blood supply, it can have shut off its own blood supply. Your worst case scenario, you open up and the entire stomach is dead, it's black. Um, most of the time that doesn't happen, but you do sometimes get a case where some of the stomach has started to die and you actually have to remove some of the stomach. And the prognosis is worse if that's the case because we're cutting into the stomach and, um, and, and the stomach wall isn't in as good shape. Um, but the idea is we untwist the stomach, we watch it, hopefully everything goes pink again. Usually all of the organs are looking just angry and upset with the world. We'll give everything a good rinse. <laughs> we give it a nice rinse with some saline and close up and, and wake the dog up. And it's touch and go then for 24, 48 hours because of all this weird chemical behavior that's gone on in the blood. There are these things called, I'm, I'm throwing posh words at you now, but it's kind of cool in a traumatic way, myocardial depressant factors. These are chemicals whose entire job it is to make your heart not work properly. Um, I don't know who invented them. It wasn't me. <laughs> They should, what? Well, don't put those there. That's a stupid idea. But you get all these myocardial depressant factors. So basically, your dog's blood is now full of chemicals that are designed to kill it. Yeah. Um, and we just keep them on a drip, keep monitoring the heart. It might do some weird stuff. We might need to treat the weird stuff. The weird stuff might go away and come back again. The treatment for the weird stuff the heart might do can also cause the heart to do weird stuff. So basically, your vet is going to be very, very stressed for 48 hours or so. Lucky you. Um, and hopefully, uh, everything pans out right the other way. After we've untwisted the stomach, by the way, we do that surgery I talked about before, that preventative surgery that you can do. So we make an incision in the stomach, in the outside of the stomach, an incision in the inside of the body, and we stick them together, we sew them together, so that hopefully your dog's stomach can never twist again. It doesn't mean your dog's stomach can't bloat again, but bloating is less life-threatening than twisting. Um, you know, the, the really sad cases are where you've untwisted, the dog's recovered well, and then they bloat again a few days later, and you recover them, and then they bloat again two weeks later, and then at that point the parents are like, you know, it mostly happens in dogs that are eight to ten years old or older, how much are you going to put your dog through if it keeps happening? And, and it, so we do get cases where 
you know, they might be in that 90% statistic of they survived, but they might not survive the month. Um, so we do get some sad cases like that. It does happen sometimes. But I would say that still the majority of dogs that come into the vets with bloat, they survive, they don't bloat again, um, or they don't bloat again seriously. They don't bloat again later on down the line. Um, and, you know, they, they live out a happy life without worrying about their stomach anymore. Um, but yeah, it, it's, it's very, very scary. And so if you've got a great day, you know, you're thinking about getting a great day, look into getting a prophylactic gastropexy, so a preventative surgery to prevent that from happening. It is advised because Great Danes, I can't quite remember what the percentages of Great Danes that bloat. I think it's something like 60%. It's, it's some ridiculously high figure where you're just, it, it's almost more likely to happen than to not happen. Yeah. Certainly if it's a bitch because, you know, if we're opening her to spay her anyway, well, while you're in there you know, right as well. uh, it's actually it's a smaller surgery than the spay so perfect oh thank you so much uh, for answering those questions marianne i've taken up a lot more of your time than i initially scheduled it <laughs> sorry I, I guess i'm excited about these things because i find them really interesting otherwise i wouldn't do this for a job <laughs> I, I, I find it really interesting which is why i come to you with like weird and wonderful questions <laughs> it's always good to know and at the vets, you know, when you when you have people in with these problems, you're often limited by time as to how much you can explain. And and also, you know, it's said that people only re remember like 20 or 30 percent of what's said in a veterinary consultation, because like usually you're stressed, you're rushed. You just need to remember, like, what medication am I giving or when? So remembering the exact details of why this has happened in the first place Um often that's a bit too much. And that's the bit that falls at the head later. So it's nice to have an opportunity to just sort of take the time to explain it. So if somebody's been to the vets, had one of these issues or wondered about one of these issues and the vet maybe explained it, but now they can only remember some of it or the vet rushed it a little bit because you know, <laughs> there was a bloat coming in or something. Um, then, you know, you've got a bit of time to like, you can replay it and be like, oh, okay, that makes sense. I hope it makes sense. 